10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Manchester one, United have zero. reached the promised land. Yeah, what's up, everybody? Good morning. Sam here, live on United People's TV. It's Friday. Everybody's feeling chipper in the comments today. There's no football to ruin the weekend. Eric Ten Hag, he's won the title. Eric Ten Hag's already meeting John Murto out in Amsterdam less than a day after clinching the 36th, by the way, league title with Ajax and, coming, and, and finishing his Ajax career on a high note. He's already at work. That's what I want to see from my manager. We're going to run through that in this morning's show. It's Friday. We're going to get the interactive map up. I'm going to answer as many of your questions as I possibly can throughout the show. I'm going to run through that meeting uh, that Ten Hag had with Murto. I'm going to get straight into it, run through all the details about the transfer plans, about the fact that he wants Frankie de Jong. The whole Frankie de Jong thing has sort of really exploded in the last like 24 hours, I suppose, after Eric Ten Hag sealed the deal. With the title, that's when he can become United manager. That's when we can start having these conversations. I'll run through that. We're going to speak about Steve McLaren. We're going to speak about Mitchell van der Gag. We're going to speak about Conte and United. Another argument came up yesterday. I'm going to speak about that. But look, let me head down to the comments, see how we're all doing here. We've got Stephen. Good morning to you. Jason. Good morning to you. Yogi. Takeoff. Nick. Calvin. Anuj. Matt. Jedi. Anthony. JJ, yes, everybody down here. Someone left a super chat, by the way, before we start. I just want to say thank you for that. Yes, same morning, Sam, from New Zealand, all the way from New Zealand. I want to show some support and say you're doing amazing. To, mate, I, I really appreciate that, man. And I'm sure I saw someone join up there as a member. Don't want to miss that. Helen, Helgon, I recognize you. I think you already maybe were a member. Maybe you upgraded. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. Dan, feeling very nice. I thought it was 95% there. Oh, dear, more FUD. We're simply reporting what's being reported. That was, of course, Gerard Romero. But everything that's happened since... I think Gerard probably overstepped when he went with the 95, if we're talking pure numbers-wise. He may have overstepped, although he did double down on it. He seems very, very confident that deal is going to happen. But let's run through everything that's happened to do with that meeting. That's where the good thing is. Our Fred's coming up here, letting everybody know it's Friday the 13th. I was born on the 13th, or well, that was a Monday, not a Friday. So technically, I'm not cursed. So that's all right. But look. How are you all doing? You let me know your questions, your comments, your concerns, anything about Frankie de Jong. No doubt he's the big talking point at the moment, right? Literally, as soon as Ajax won the title, Gerard Romero came in with that curveball after the FA Youth Cup was won by the under-18s, saying 95% done, and everybody went a bit mad. I, would say, I wouldn't say it's really calmed down since then. Uh, you've got James Ducker, who's confirmed that Manchester United are interested in signing him. You've got uh, Simon Stone from the BBC. Everybody linked with the club have all confirmed that Manchester United are in for Frankie de Jong. So it's very, very exciting. Leo, nice to see you down there uh, as, as joining as a member as well. Where are you watching from? I'll try and give you a shout out. Anybody uh, who has joined as a member, you know by now that I do try and interact with your comments more. It's a perk of being a member. You show support to me on the channel. I'll show support to you with your comments. But look, let's run through this. This is, this is what you want to see, right? As I said, less than a day after clinching the title with Ajax, Eric Ten Hag's already getting to work. Yes, please. I'm going to run through this full article in detail because not only does it speak about Frankie de Jong and the fact that Eric Ten Hag wants him and he's on his transfer list, also runs through the positions that he wants to sign. You can see it right there. Ten Hag ideally wants two midfielders, a versatile forward, and a centre-back this summer for Manchester United. That's a perfect summer. I think, well, not a perfect summer. I did. You do everything you want to do. But a perfect summer within reasonable expectation. That's what I would call that summer. And it should be well within our reach. Let's run through it, right? Leo, there you go, watching from Malaysia. Nice to see you there. Big up to you, my friend. I, honestly, mate, it's a bit... I, I, I don't... I suppose I do say it quite a lot. I don't say it enough, I don't think, but... I love the support that you give me and I love the community that's growing. As I said, I, I try to be as interactive and, and as factual as possible. There's so much United news out there. It's kind of hard to keep on top of it all. I try and do that for you. So that's why you're joining the shows in the morning. So drop a like on the video and let's run through this one. Uh, this is, as I said, it's from James Ducker from The Telegraph saying, Manchester United held Amsterdam Transfer Summit with Eric Ten Hag as the club mull a move for Frankie de Jong. Ten Hag wants, as I said, those two midfielders, a versatile forward and a centre-half. Let's read through this together. So Manchester United held recruitment talks with Eric Ten Hag in Amsterdam on Thursday 
as the club ident- intensify their summer transfer plans with Barcelona Frank- midfielder Frankie De Jong among their targets. Now, you let me know about De Jong in the comments, right? As We'll have a conversation about him every day. We'll see how it changes. As far as we know from Spain, De Jong hasn't done anything to angle for a move away. I think he's pretty happy in Barcelona. If Manchester United didn't come in, if Barcelona didn't try to sell, he wouldn't be unhappy. He starts most of the games for Barcelona, but rarely does he finish them. We spoke about that yesterday. Uh, really surprised me that stat. 13 out of 33 games under Xavi, De Jong's not completed the full 90 minutes. He is a, he's a squad player. Obviously, he's someone who's utilised a lot, but he's a squad player rather than one of those integral players that can't be taken out of the team like Pedri and Gavi. So that's a little bit of an interesting angle from from Frankie de Jong and his happiness in Spain. He won't be pushing for the move away, and it all comes down to whether or not Barcelona will use him and selling him to finance their summer. Let's go down here. Just hours after guiding Ajax to a third Eredivisie title in four seasons, Ten Hag met with Murto in Amsterdam to discuss potential ins and outs. Now, this is what you want to see, man. This sentence right here. Ten Hag is determined to hit the ground running at Old Trafford as United prepare to embark on a long-term rebuild and believes there is little time to waste this summer. And I've, I've got to say something about that straight away, right? It absolutely is the case that Manchester United cannot afford to waste time. Now, I know that I know we say that every summer. In an ideal world, we'll go back, we, we'll go back to how we did it under Fergie. You remember what transfer deadline day always used to be like under Fergie? You could sit there with your feet up as a United fan, watch Sky Sports News and just point and laugh at other clubs. Because our deals had all be, always been done. We were never involved in a deadline day scrap. And it was just it was just entertaining. Since then, we've signed Fellaini on deadline day, Falcao on deadline day, Cavani on deadline day. I don't know who else. we uh, Igalo on deadline day. We've done so many late deals because we just sit on our sit on our hands at the start of the window, like Cavani, the perfect example. A player who was available on a free transfer all summer was signed on deadline day. That's poor. But Ten Hag wants to change that this summer. And starting early, as City have shown by signing Haaland, as Dortmund have shown by getting Adiemi from Red Bull Salzburg as his replacement, we're going to have to act swiftly. And especially if we want to get our key, key signings. Um, let me go up here and see what you're saying in the comments. And you're saying, Sam, the young worries me a bit. I'm concerned if he comes, it'll be because of the wages and not Ten Hag, because, not because he wants to play for United. Yet another player playing with the wrong motivation. Now, the thing about De Jong, which I think United need to get clarity on straight away, is this. I'm seeing a lot of reports from a lot of different angles, both in England and Spain, all saying that Champions League football is a priority for Frankie De Jong. And in my, in my opinion, maybe it's because it's the narrative that I want it to fit. I believe that the pull of Eric Ten Hag will be bigger than the pull of Champions League football. That's why, that's in my, because they got an extremely close bond as, as a manager and a player. But if Champions League football really is a priority for Frankie de Jong next year, then simply put, Manchester United have to just end the pursuit of Frankie de Jong right now. We need to get that, we need to get that knowledge straight away, right? Because that will define whether or not we actually waste our time going after him or whether there's a reason we go after him. He's on big wages. I think he's on like 200,000 euros a week after taxes uh, in, in Barcelona. He'd come in and probably be, I would say, be pretty damn equal with Bruno Fernandes, if not a little bit more than what Bruno Fernandes is on. But it's, it, it, yeah, it, it's, that, it's that one thing. What's the bigger pull for Frankie de Jong? Eric Ten Hag and reuniting with his old Ajax manager? or Champions League football next season. Because ideally, if all goes well, Manchester United will be playing Champions League football in the 2023-24 season and Ten Hag's second season in charge. It all depends on what is the bigger priority for De Jong. Uh, uh, there's no point talking about anything pre-tax. Uh, I'm talking about post-tax. Uh, Mills, you're joining as a member. How are you doing there, buddy? Uh, nice to see you there. And Helgon, nice to see you there as well. I was obviously joining as a team captain earlier. Uh, let me see what you're down. Uh, Craig, who do you think the CB will be on Ten Hag's radar? It's got to be Timber, hasn't it? Absolutely got to be Timber. 
I mean, I'm not sure who in the comments is comparing McTominay to Roy Keane, but go and wash your mouth out. Go and wash your mouth out. I like McTominay to a certain degree, but geez, imagine, imagine doing that. But look, that's what United have to do. And I suppose that will be part of this conversation at the meeting. Murto caught an early flight out to Amsterdam on Thursday to meet with Ten Hag to run through the transfer plans. And Mitchell van der Gag was also present at the meeting, as was Steve McLaren, right? Steve McLaren and Mitchell van der Gag both sitting alongside Eric Ten Hag for those conversations with John Murto. As them confirmed as two assistant managers that are coming into Manchester United. I might do a video on both of them. I don't particularly need to do a video on Steve McLaren. You all know who Steve McLaren is. Was our assistant manager under Fergie when we won the treble. He's got history at Manchester United. But the relationship with Eric Ten Hag was not built at United. It was built at FC Twente where Steve McLaren was the manager and Eric Ten Hag was the assistant. Be weird how that dynamic uh, switches. Uh, but I suppose it just that's just the way that their careers are gone. Eric Ten Hag's now on the way up when Steve McLaren's on the way down. And people might be worried about Steve McLaren being a, a, a Mike Phelan V2. And I don't really look at that in, in any way, shape, or form. When when Solskjaer brought, uh, when Solskjaer took in Mike Phelan as his assistant manager, it was on the recommendation of Fergie. For, he was the first person that he rang, and he got him in as his assistant manager because he didn't really know what to do. He was his mentor rather than an assistant manager, if you know what I mean. Mike Phelan was there to help guide Solskjaer through the corridors to help him understand what he's doing. Steve McLaren would be there as his assistant manager to help him understand the United culture. For, for points where he goes, hmm, not really sure about this, he'll go to Steve McLaren. He's bringing in Mitchell van der Gag as his actual assistant manager. I mean, they're both going to be assistant managers, but I don't personally have to look at this Steve McLaren situation with any sort of, hmm, not sure about that, in the same way that some of you might have looked at the Mike Phelan situation. I think they're very different. That's, something, that's one thing I would say about that. I uh, know, Paula, I absolutely want to see Steve McLaren only speak in that crappy Dutch accent. I need to get that video up. It's hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. Buta, you think there's no chance that De Jong's coming because we're not getting Champions League football? Let's find out. Let's find out. Uh, and and you're, not, you're not feeling very chippy this morning. I thought our aim now was to sign players. You see United as the goal, not the destination. I can't see De Jong joining, seeing us as anything but a step down rather than a step up. Uh, no. I just, I know, I just disagree completely. United might be considered a, a step down from Barcelona in, in the sense that, cool, we might not be playing Champions League football next this year, but fucking Barcelona literally just got spanked out, the, out of the Europa League this year. They've been playing Europa League football this season. Barcelona are not Barcelona as they used to be. Manchester United are now, we might not like it, but we are a project again. But we're a different sort of project. We're a good project. And we're a project that I think we are going forward. Where's the Barry song gone? Someone wants a bit of Barry. We're gonna do it anyway. 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 There's Barry. Come on, Barry. He'll never leave. Don't worry about that. Barry's always sitting there waiting and he's watching to come on the channel just in case anybody says anything stupid. Um... Uh, if Fizz, what are you saying? It's be nice to get to Young. Looks like we're going Dutch like bastard in the past. Should we go for the Lick 2 or am I being delusional? Um, I think... I think the Delict rumours are probably just a bit like, oh, yeah, okay, right, just bring the whole band back together. I don't probably think that um, we're going to get Delict. I also think Delict would be way, way overpriced. You're going to be looking at the same price that they paid for, like 70, 80 million for Delict. Timber makes far more sense than Delict. This has to be a summer where we're smart and, and the easy, I, I would say us getting linked with Delict is a bit of lazy journalism. We do need a centre-back, but it's, I don't think realistically we can get De Jong and a defensive midfielder and a set of versatile forward and then Delict on top of that. It's just not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, Gene, you're, you're, Gene, you're having also the same concerns as... Um, uh, and down there saying that we're going to have to offer him a premium on his wages to get him here with no Champions League football. No, we won't. And if that's the case, then he won't come in. We won't be we won't be giving De Jong like 400 grand a week like Erling Haaland. Eric Ten Hag won't need to do that. <laughs> he just won't need to do that. Simply put, if he comes in, we'll probably match what he's on at Barcelona, if not a little bit of a downgrade. 
And yeah, it might be a step down in his career. But as I said, that that that's where you, we don't understand the pull of Eric Ten Hag. Previously, any player who came to United when we didn't have Champions League football, oh, they're just in it for the money. They don't want to play for the club. It is different because Eric Ten Hag is our manager. And you have to understand that. It's not just about joining United for X amount of money or because there's X amount of trophies. It is because he is the manager who brought him through. And the bond that they have as manager and player is deeper than most. And that's why if he does come to United, it won't simply be because, ah, he's just he's just on more money, doesn't care about the shirt. It's nowhere near as simple as that. You can't do it like that. I don't think so anyway. Leo, what are you saying? If Ten Hag wants the young, we should support him 100%. In the same way that Ten Hag wanted Steve McLaren, Maybe some of us would have been like, mm, Steve McLaren? No, you don't undermine your manager. If, if he wants McLaren, you go and get McLaren. If he wants De Jong, go and get De Jong. And I've said this to you before, and I will reiterate this every single stream we have. If we don't sign De Jong, it will be a picture of De Jong on the wall that Eric Ten Hag points to and says, sign me a player as close to him as possible. That is the profile of the player that we want, that I want at the club. If it's not going to be De Jong, someone else. All right. Let's go back to the interview in the meeting. Let's see what else was discussed. Uh, Ten Hag ideally wants two midfielders, a versatile forward and a centre half this summer as part of a squad overhaul with at least a dozen players facing uncertain futures with a number of new arrivals and United's overall spend likely to be heavily influenced by who departs. Who do you think realistically is going to be sold this summer? Right. You let me know in the comments below. We've spoken about this before. I've already done my keep or sell. We already know that Cavani, Pogba, Mata, Lingard and Matic are all leaving on free transfers. And we've got the likes of Eric Bai, who's unhappy. Dean Henderson, who's unhappy. Phil Jones, who should be sold. Anthony Martial, who should be sold. Andreas Pereira, who should be sold. That's five players technically who could leave. Don't particularly think I see us selling all of those. I think Phil Jones has to be sold. Somewhere between five and ten million. Go to a club like Aston Villa. Hell, maybe even back, back to Blackburn. Probably not back to Blackburn. But 5 to 10 million for Phil Jones seems reasonable. Martial, somewhere between 20 and 30, I think is reasonable. Andreas Pereira, geez, just get the 10 million and ship him off, please. Eric Bai, somewhere between 10 and 15. Maybe go back to Villarreal. There is real opportunity for United to smartly make between, I think, 40 and 70 million on fringe players and players who don't really have a future at the club that can go back in to our pot to spend. Uh, let's go down here. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, total 10, 10 players sold, all of Ole's signings. I mean, Wan-Bissaka's being linked with the move back to Crystal Palace. Of course, that will probably be on... You imagine if uh, Wan-Bissaka does leave, it will be on a season-long loan with an intention to buy. I don't think that Crystal Palace would come in with the money straight away. Uh, 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 Maguire's going no, I don't think Maguire will go this summer even though I think he should be going we've already had this discussion I don't think he'll be part of this This rebuild will come in, in stages stage one doesn't include selling Harry Maguire even if we want to um, lots and lots of you all sort of agree with me it's, it's, those, it's those names on the list isn't it Martial, Jones, Pereira I'm not really sure who else uh, Tellez, I don't, I don't think Tellez will go I mean Tellez could go this summer Logically, realistic, logically, Tellez to be sold, Alvaro Fernandez to come in. Maybe Brandon Williams is a third backup choice. Don't know. And then we move on and we move forward with that. There's no, in my opinion, there's no way that Alvaro Fernandez will be any worse than Alex Tellez was at left back. And I think he'll be much better. He certainly will be better going forward. Um, let's go back into the story and let's read a bit more. United are pursuing a deal for De Jong. Let's, let's read a bit more about this. It's what James Duck is saying about the De Jong situation. United are pursuing a deal for De Jong, but face an uphill battle to convince the midfielder to move to Old Trafford if Barcelona agree to sell. Ten Hag and De Jong enjoyed success together at Ajax, and the incoming United manager would like to be reunited with him as part of a new-look midfield. Uh, with Matic going, Pogba going, Lingard, Mata... Remolding the midfield is a priority and United are aware that Barca could be open to offloading De Jong. Barca need to sell players and you know that we've spoken about that in some detail already and I will speak about it in more detail. Simply put, they need to... I need to get rid of that. OCD. Ah, that's better. Um, Barca need to sell. Manchester United have an opportunity. If Eric Ten Hag wasn't our manager, 
this wouldn't be a conversation. Sim simply put, it's it, it's it's the Ten Hag versus the Champions League pool. That's what I want to get um, some updates on, and over the next couple of days, because everything you're hearing from Spain is that the Champions League football is is, is a real priority for the young, which is a bit weird, is it? I suppose it's not a bit weird. Every player wants to play in that. I don't know. I don't know. At this point, I'm very torn. I'd love De Jong. I'd go as far as to say that, honestly, if we were to sign one player this summer, I think I think I would choose Franco De Jong. Honestly, I think he could have that much of a transformative impact on our midfield. I suppose the issue about that is that he, when it comes to the Ten Hag system and his peak was when he was playing alongside not only a ball-winning defensive midfielder, but a defensive midfielder who was, who was good at the boring stuff. For, for, for De Jong to shine at Manchester United, he would need a midfielder alongside him who's great at winning the ball back, but also very good at just re ball retention. Nice little short passes back into the centre-backs, one-twos with the full-backs. Somebody who's not really going to lose the ball, which then allows De Jong to focus on the vertical transitions, on playing through the lines, on being the playmaker from deep. At Manchester United, we don't have that at the moment. Fred, great ball winner, not particularly good at ball retention. In fact, I say he's pretty damn bad at it. Those short passes, you're like, what are you doing, Fred? Scott McTominay, he's not a holding midfielder. He's never been a holding midfielder, simply put. James Garner, even if he comes in, he's played his better games for, um, sorry, for Nottingham Forest when he's played further up the pitch. He's not a defensive midfielder. We don't have that. So for De Jong to work, he needs to be complimented. We need to sign a player like Aurelien Chouameni alongside him. And now that is the dream. That is the dream. Yeah, it's nice to see you there joining from New Zealand, my friend. I already know where you're watching from. And I remember that. Remember that today is, the, um, today is of course, Friday, which means it's the Interactive Map Day. So I'm going to get the map up later on in the show. Uh, lots of you talking about Kamara. I'm going to do a separate video on defensive midfielders. There was a fantastic article that came out today on The Athletic, which I won't run through in this video but i think i might base a, vi a video off the back of it they've got some great scouting that they've done and comparing defensive midfield options and i think it deserves us to take a look at that video now let's go over here to the bbc and let's see what simon stone has been saying about that meeting in amsterdam that happened between Murto, ten Hag, mclaren and van der gag is what he said very similar of course he said look that he met with Murto on thursday Blah, 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 won the title. BBC Sport understands a 52-year-old has already spent plenty of time researching the United squad and determining the weaknesses that need addressing. And that's something that we're really hearing, right? Because this, it's what we need. I think Ten Hag's done as much research into Manchester United as Manchester United did research into Eric Ten Hag. And there really is a fascinating interview that was released on Voitball International behind the premium. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay for the premium. I'm going to get that full interview and I'm going to do a video on it. Maybe over the weekend. Uh, because inside this interview, like this, like this little quote here, it's a fantastic quote. Said Eric, This is what Eric Ten Hag said about Manchester United. Despite it being a beautiful club, I would never just start. I wanted to create good working conditions first. So every detail had to be taken care of. And as I said, it's a really fascinating interview because we, as fans, we want to try and get an understanding of the psyche of Eric Ten Hag. What exactly makes him tick? And he's somebody who's known as a kind of a meticulous obsessive. But I'm saying that in a positive way. Because if you can use an obsession in the right direction and the right way and you mold it, it really can be an asset to you. And he clearly is an obsessive, somebody who, who looks over every single detail. And that's what we've needed. We've needed fine details. We've needed a meticulous approach. We needed discipline and direction as a football club. And Eric Ten Hag really is doing that. So that's the main takeaway I've got from that interview is that it almost felt like, it almost feels, sorry, that, that Eric Ten Hag interviewed Manchester United just as much as Manchester United interviewed Eric Ten Hag. It was almost like a two-way interview. It wasn't like somebody who's going for his dream job. He's quaking in his boots. He'll do anything to suck up to the boss. He'll be like, hmm, no. And I like that. I really, really like that. Uh, Binder, what are you saying? Ronaldo means 25 goals a season guarantee. Absolutely. 
honestly, I, I keep saying this as well. If you drop, if you drop that Ronaldo team into this City team, Ronaldo into this City team this year, my God, he would have scored like 30, 40 goals. It would have been ridiculous. Alan, you're saying it's good that Eric Ten Hag still want to manage United after the last few. These last few performances won't particularly change anything. Uh, just in the same way that my excitement for Eric Ten Hag wouldn't have been dampened if Ajax didn't win the league. Those last two games wouldn't have changed my own mindset about Eric Ten Hag. Obviously, it, it solidifies it a little bit by him winning the title, but I wouldn't, had Ajax not won the league this year, I wouldn't have come away thinking, oh my God, we've signed a bottler. It just it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened. And as Lloyd said here, the work begins. Entertainment, you're saying it's rather him motivate him. Hey, look, everybody needs to get dead excited about what's coming next because it th it really is going to change. Back to Simon Stone here. He's saying uh, United have had a long-standing desire to bring an essential midfield player, but a search for new recruits is likely to be expanded significantly. Given interim boss Ralph Rannick has spoken of ten additions potentially being needed, given the number of players set to leave, and he mentions that Van der Gag was there and Steve McLaren was both there. And then if you look at what Fabrizio Romano has said this morning, he said this. He said, Manchester United are preparing the contracts for both Mitchell van der Gag and Steve McLaren as they will join Eric Ten Hag. Van der Gag told Ajax three weeks ago of his intention to sign for United. Now, I believe, by the way, uh, uh, that Mitchell van der Gag was offered the Ajax job full time. They have went and they've brought back, I can't remember his name, but I believe he was the assistant manager back in 2018-19 under... Eric Ten Hag. And this season, I believe he was actually the assistant. He started the season as the assistant for Ronald Koeman, who was then sacked. And then he became Club Bruges manager. And now he's going to be Ajax manager. Hell of a year for him. Um, Eric Ten Hag builds lifelong loyalties when he builds his teams. And I think that Mitchell van der Gag said exactly that. Loyalty. Mitchell van der Gag turned down the opportunity to be the man at the helm at Ajax, the manager, to follow Eric Ten Hag and become his assistant manager at Manchester United. That's loyalty. It's a massive, massive show of loyalty, that. Because he wants to be part of that project. And that's what I mean about the the De Jong and the Eric Ten Hag pool, which we can't really truly understand, and we won't ever know. But it depends how much you think that's going to pull Ten Hag, pull, pull De Jong towards United. Rather than the money, rather than what competitions we're playing in, it's simply a case of maybe not it's more the fact that he would want to play for Eric Ten Hag again than he would want to play for Manchester United. But both of those would come together. And Eric Ten Hag could make Frankie de Jong one of the, the central pieces of this new-look Manchester United team. And, that'll be, that, and that is very, very exciting. Uh, look, Ajax do love their ball managers. Absolutely, they do. Uh, looking forward to seeing what Ten Hag brings to the club, says Helen. Absolutely. Uh, look, good morning to you, Prince, Ma and Isaac. Good morning to everybody watching. You know what you're to do right now. If you're new to United People's TV, welcome aboard. Make sure you please drop a like on the video and subscribe to United People's TV. What I do in these uh, live news shows every morning, I bring you all the news that's happened in the last 12, 24 hours about Manchester United, so you don't have to search around for it all. I try and explain it in a bit of detail. Today, we're running through the uh, meeting that happened in Amsterdam yesterday between Ten Hag, Murto, Van der Gag and McLaren that confirms that both Van der Gag and McLaren are coming in as a coaching staff. Good. We need that, right? I said this before. I said, look, Man City are out there confirming Erling Haaland as their new striker, and we don't even know who our assistant managers are going to be. That's now done and dusted. It's not official. It will be official at some point soon. Van der Gag and McLaren. I might do a video separately on that. But this, you speak about, you speak about Steve McLaren. You speak about being scared of him just becoming a Mike Velen V2. This is what he said back in March, by the way, after the game against City. Steve, Mc this is a, he was interviewed by Talksport. Steve McLaren believes five or six Manchester United players don't deserve to wear the shirt. Well, Steve, that's the mentality that I think a lot of us United fans can nod in agreement at. Come into Manchester United with that sort of approach. Obviously, it's easy to be that clinical when you're just interviewed when you're not part of Manchester United, but we need that sort of clinical no-nonsense approach in our management, in our coaching. Because there are so many players that just don't deserve to wear that shirt. They don't. Absolutely do not. But bring that mentality in, Steve, and you'll definitely do well. Andy, good morning to you. 
Patience is going to be key, he says. With any of Eric Ten Hag's transfers, a toxic culture needs to be fixed, which will be no easy task. And until it's sorted, it could impact new transfers. Of course it will. And the, the comparison I'd like to draw is when Fergie came into the club. Uh, Fergie came into the club in the 80s and there was a massive drinking culture. It was just, it was just what happened. I don't know whether it was just Manchester United. I think it was just England as a whole. But in Manchester United, there was a massive drinking culture. And Fergie had to boot that out of the door to bring in a level of professionalism into the club. And bit by bit, he built it. And we know, of course, it took him a good few years. Uh, and we know what happened from 92 onwards. 93 onwards, sorry. But I'm not saying that, that Ten Hag's got... He didn't have a drinking culture, but he's got a... Fergie came into Manchester United with a culture that wasn't built for success. And he had to get rid of that culture and build a new culture into the club. And he did it incredibly well. Eric Ten Hag has a similar task on his hands. He's coming into Manchester United with an in, into an entitled culture with a bunch of players who feel like they've made it as soon as they've signed that United contract rather than going, OK, this is step one on this new ladder. And that culture is the culture that he's got to get rid of. And it took Fergie time and it will take Ten Hag time. There's no way that Ten Hag will get as much time as Fergie did. Football's gone differently. Football's gone to the stratosphere. The money involved... The demands on it means it has to happen immediately now, 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 right? But it's a similar sort of, it's a similar sort of cultural problem, dilemma that faces him. And I hope that he can do it. I absolutely hope that he can do it. Uh, Stephen, you're saying Stephen McLaren's a great number two. He struggled as a main man, but history proves an assistant is very good and knowledgeable. I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do at the club. I mean, no, looking forward is probably the wrong way to describe it. I'm not exactly, I'm not exactly dead excited about Steve McLaren coming back in, all right? I don't think anybody's going to go and say, Mum, Steve McLaren's... Uh, uh, who? No. No, one, no. no one's going to be buzzing about Steve McLaren coming in. But if Eric Ten Hag wants him in, then I support Eric Ten Hag. I support every decision that he is going to do from now on. He cannot be undermined by the club. I think there was probably some kickback from within the club about Steve McLaren. But ultimately... He's got his way. And that's what it should be. Ten Hag is the manager now. He, he manages. He is the decision maker that decides how this football club is shaped. And if Steve McLaren, he, if he wants Steve McLaren to be part of that, I trust him that Steve McLaren is the right man to be part of that. That's what I think anyway. Um, look, I'll head down to the comments here. Actually, no, look, I'll tell you what. Let's head to the interactive map. Before I do, actually, I want to quickly say a big thank you, as always, to Bet Victor for supporting United People's TV on these Friday streams. This video this week is McCola talking about players who should leave clubs. And I tell you what, I don't exactly agree with this one, Adam. So who should leave their club this summer in search of better pastures? The obvious one will probably be Cristiano Ronaldo, but I'm not going to say that because then i got to get rid of that. So let's go, Harry Kane. Otherwise, the guy's going to be sat at Spurs, not winning a trophy for so, so long. In fact, I'm starting to think... He's part of the problem. I mean, there's some seriously odd takes there. Some seriously odd takes from Adam. Number one, Ronaldo. I, would never, I wouldn't sell Ronaldo. This. Ronaldo is definitely, look, he's just one player of the bloody month again. The Premier League player of the month with us playing this bad. Ridiculous. But Harry Kane, we've spoken about Harry Kane in a bit of detail. He showed last night again against Arsenal. <laughs> By the way, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I just didn't, I really revel in Arsenal being shit. I love it. I really, really love it. And probably in the same way that everybody loves, everybody who's not a United fan loves watching the United be crap. But Harry Kane, I've spoken about him in detail. I've spoken about him on the podcast this week in a bit of detail. I think he's probably the greatest striker in the Premier League, has been for a long time. But I don't think United can afford him this summer. And I don't think he should be a target. But you can let me know what you think about Harry Kane, about Ronaldo and what McCola had to say. There's a link in the description. Go over to the Bet Victor channel. Make sure you, I left a comment on there. Make sure you drop a like on the comment I did. It will support the channel. It will support Bet, Bet Victor. And everyone wins. But yeah, McCola, I'm not sure I would even consider the idea. No, I wouldn't consider the idea of getting rid of Ronaldo. But look, anybody, let, let me know where you're watching from here. Because today, of course, is Friday. So you let me know. I'll get three names on the map here quickly. And then we're going to speak about this. This is a really interesting talking point. We're going to speak about Antonio Conte because the debate has come up yesterday again. And I want to speak about it. But look, before we do that, 
make sure you let me know where you're watching from the town and the country i'll get three of you added onto the map let me go down here and see what you're saying here oh look mark watching from chesterfield there you go boom on you go mark i see you regularly in the stream my friend so let me add you onto the map from chesterfield in derbyshire look at that on you go sir welcome aboard mark nice to have you here who else we got down here um da, da, da. richie watching from kerry in ireland there you go how you doing richie make sure you subscribe i, just, I think you already have subscribed because nobody on this channel can leave a comment i've just typed richie in whoops kerry in ireland i've not been to kerry before have I? I don't think i have I've only been east and i've been west i don't think anyway let's get one more on here let's have a look uh we've got dallas we're going we're going uk today apparently jedi i can see you there my friend you're always here let me get you onto the map bispam in blackpool i've never been blackpool i'm missing much i don't think i am but you might you might disagree you might tell me otherwise but look that's three of you added onto the map as i always say louis watching the whole way from japan we've got uh philip from chesterfield we've got peter from northwich Paul from Botswana, Kagan from Uganda, Prince from Ghana. Oh, by the way, I think, uh, random, I'm pretty sure Kendrick Lamar is in Accra. Fun fact, I messaged my mate who I stayed with for a few months. I was like, I'm pretty sure Kendrick Lamar is in, in Accra launching a new album. You might want to check that out. That was pretty cool. But look, let's get into this debate here. This I really am interested to find your opinions on because I feel very, very strongly on this. And I don't think every United fan will share this opinion. The question there posed by James Robson, who I believe writes for Eurosport. He said, how would the United season have looked if they'd appointed Conte when he wanted the job? Woodward chose to write this season off in November. Levy was desperate to salvage it. My response to that was this. I'd have much preferred the pain of the second half of this season and the wider changes that are coming as a consequence rather than Conte likely doing well and well enough to paper over the craps Craps, cracks, probably craps, paper over the cracks and let us slip into another cycle of nothing but false dawns, failures, and another sacking. Now, I need to know whether you agree with me or not, because I don't think everybody does. And I'll be interested if you don't agree, why, why don't you agree? Because for the life of me, looking at Manchester United's problems, looking at everything that's happened in the second half of the season, I just, my gut is telling me that Conte would have come into this team and definitely got us playing better. I think we definitely would have finished top four with Conte in. And I don't think he would have been sacked. I think he would have been back with the transfer budget in the summer. But I just don't particularly feel that it would have stopped the cycle that United kept dipping into and dipping out of. It felt like we needed this, this real pain. This, sec this second half of this season has been... It's probably the worst we've ever watched in the Premier League. It's not going to be the worst season we've ever had in, in the league. We got relegated in the 70s. So, you know, it's, it's been 10 times worse than this before. But from what we've watched in the Premier League, I don't think it's been any worse in the second half of the season. But I, I wouldn't trade that in for a top four finish. And then the beginnings of another series of false hopes where Conte makes two or three signings. We look decent. We maybe get up towards third place. We can't go any further. When we go towards pushing for that top two, Conte wouldn't be backed in the summer with what he wants. He'd start to fall out with it. Hell, we know how the process goes. And I just think that's probably would have happened again. And it's a cycle I'm tired of. But this comes down to the immediacy and the entitlement. There's a certain, sec certain I don't know whether it's an age thing, but there's a certain type of football fan, not just United fan, that comes with a wibble mentality. I want a league title right now. I want bragging rights right now. How can you give me the bragging rights right now? Anything that doesn't do and fit that, I don't want. Out the club. Boom. Get rid of. Um, Asan, I don't think Marie, I don't think he would have been Mourinho MK. He's got similarities, but I think Conte's I think he's better than Mourinho right now. Mourinho fans might disagree with that, me there. Stefan, you're saying yes, I think it was absolutely the right decision with Randy and Ten Hag. With Conte, we'll be at the same stage we are. In two years, as we are now, with Ralph and Eric, we are building from the bottom up. Yeah, I think we, we, we've reached the bottom of the barrel. We, we kept wondering, how low can you go, United? Where is the bottom of the barrel? I think we're at the bottom now. Well, let's lose, the, let's lose the Crystal Palace before we say that. But this season, 
I think we've reached the bottom of the barrel. And yeah, I just don't see how Conte coming in in November, well, we wouldn't be getting Eric Ten Hag in for sure. And it probably would have been Ten Hag maybe staying at Ajax for one more year and then maybe going City. And then we've just got to sit and watch something else. Um, nine yards, you're saying, I'm not sure. Conte is single-minded and a no-nonsense boss. If we got him, it would have been to his terms. Some major upheavals, changes would have been made to cement the structure for the future. I think they would have been made to cement the team under him as much as possible. I'm not sure whether we would have cemented a structure that would have helped Manchester United in the long term. Uh, let's say, there's a, oh, there's, someone's called me an idiot there. Let me get that comment up. That was a good one. Where's he gone? Uh, this idiot who runs his channel, his knowledge is summed up by even mentioning Frankie de Jong. I mean, what planet must you be on to think he would leave Barcelona for United? Really? Why on earth would he leave them for our shit show? Mark, my friend, you need to die. You need, well, thanks for calling me an idiot, first of all. Second of all, do you understand Barcelona's financial situation? Their budget quite literally is minus 144 million at the moment. Minus. So you can call me an, an idiot all you want, but Barcelona will sell De Jong or somebody of that value because they need to. It's financial constraints. So if you're going to come and call me an idiot, don't make yourself look like an idiot. That's a bit weird. Uh, free gold. Um, so happy we didn't get Conte. Um, I did I did as well. Uh, did look, You're from Ghana. Big up Ghana. Uh, I don't have enough words in my vocabulary to express how much I support you in the Conte statement. Conte is Jose 2.0. And Richie, you're saying Conte would not have changed us right away. He was nearly gone at Spurs. Well, he's, well he threatened to quit a couple of times, didn't he? Um, look, man, I'm happy. I'm happy we overlooked Conte. I'm not happy with how this season's gone. But this this whole, like, you know, people say, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Jesus, it has got worse. It's got as bad as it could be, I think, anyway. As I said, let's wait until we lose Crystal Palace on the last day of the season. But yeah, it has got worse before it gets better. But now, hopefully, it gets better with the structural changes we made behind the scenes. I don't know, man. I just don't think what's happened between November and May in terms of the football has been abysmal. But what's happened between November and May in terms of the structures that be behind the manager at our club, things have really started to head in the right direction. Uh, I would probably disagree with that, Paul. I think Conte has shown with that Spurs team that he definitely would have got this Manchester United team playing better than we are playing. I'm not sure whether he would have been able to get the work ethic into them. Let's be honest. Ralph Radnick tried. And maybe it would have been different because Ralph was only an interim manager. I think if Ralph was a permanent appointment, I think he would have been far more uh, disciplined in putting his system in. He would have kept persisting and kept going rather than switching formations. Um... We've got Ali, you're watching from, I think that's to Peru. Is that Peru? Is that Canada? Canada. How are you doing? Uh, can you tell me anything about Pilistri? Facunda Pilistri? I think, where did he spend on loan? Where did, where did he spend? Was it uh, Real Sociedad? Let me have a look where Facunda Pilistri went on loan. Facunda Pilistri. Let me have a look. I think it was Sociedad. How good my knowledge is. No, Alaves. Boo. Swing and a miss from me. Anyway, he went on loan to La Liga. But look, I think Pellistri will be back involved in the preseason tour. I'm excited to see what he does there. Remember, it was Pellistri and Ilanga were the two players who shone last preseason. Pellistri then went out alone again, and Ilanga broke out into the first team. Maybe we could see Pellistri doing the same thing this season. But look, last five minutes of the show, as I always do, you fire in your questions. I'll try and answer as many as possible. I used to do a call-in. I'm going to be bringing um, the call-ins back. Um, don't worry about that. I haven't just ignored them. I haven't closed the arms permanently. I've just been focusing on different things. As you can tell, things are a bit busy at the moment. Things are going crazy. Um, but it's exciting times coming up. It really, really is. Uh, and you're saying, Sam, I feel Conte may have gotten a tune out of this squad because like many of his players, his focus is on his own personal success above all else. I absolutely know. Without doubt, that Conte would have got us into the top. I don't know, without doubt. My gut is telling me that we would have finished top four with Conte. And my gut is that we would have been playing much better football. My gut is also what was said there. In a couple of years' time, I think we would have been back in this situation. So that's why that's why I said that last night. And I was just I'm interested. I was interested to find out your opinion on that, whether you agree with that. Now let's go down here. Uh, Lachia, of course, you can get a shout out from Singapore. How are you doing? Nice to see you down there in the comments. 
Uh, do you think we really need two midfielders with Donny and Garner returning? Yes, Adrian. I can't say that loudly enough. We need a ball. We need one midfielder whose two purposes are ball winning and ball retention. That's it. Win the ball back, pass it sideways. That's what we need, first and foremost, probably. Second of all, we need a deep line playmaker, someone of De Jong's ilk, who can focus on the progression of the ball, on bringing the ball forward. Somebody who's good with the ball at his feet, probably could do a little bit of dribbling himself, but also very good at finding those line-breaking passes, the transition, the build-up play. Combining those two in midfield, I guarantee our centre-backs look a lot better. Our centre-backs have been massively exposed by the lack of that in front of them. Quite a lot of the time. Uh, Paul, do you think we're going to lose Henderson? I think, that, I think there's a possibility of that now. I think uh, it was a f from where Henderson went last season to going into this season, probably our number one and then getting COVID. And then De Gea came back through and he's just taken the reins again. Of course, Ajax were being linked with a move for Henderson back when Onana was, of course, I think he was... Is he going into Milan? I think he signed the pre-contract agreement. And then Stecklenburg Stekelen came back in. I think he was injured at that time, so they had their third choice. But then the Henderson rumors kind of went down. I think Van der Sar might have like poo-pooed the rumors as well, just like quieting them down. But Henderson, if he really is ambitious, I think he'll push for a move away this summer. I think that could definitely happen. Um, Sam, we need De Jong and Basuma. I think that'll be a great partnership, really. It's for me, it's the young plus one. You know that my plus one ideally would be true of many, but that if United, and that's why I'm happy this happened yesterday, right? That's why I think this was necessary. Someone like true of many, if Manchester United don't move quickly and aggressively, we'll just we'll miss out on true of many. There is whether or not true of many is on that list. Maybe it's going to be someone like Frankie de Jong and we go and sign Bubakar Kamara for free again. That's a midfield duo, which definitely is a significant upgrade on what we've got. Um, Harry, you're saying thoughts on Darwin Nunes. My gut instinct about Darwin Nunes is this word here. I don't particularly think that's a word that you would massively associate with Darwin Nunes. If I was looking at what Darwin Nunes, I wouldn't call him versatile. I would call him an out-and-out -out striker, an out-and-out -out goal scorer. That's what he does. Someone like Christopher Nkunku is somebody who can play across the front three. He can play as a supporting striker. He's got far more versatility to his game. So I'm not sure that Darwin Nunes will tick the boxes that Eric Ten Hag wants. Will Diallo get another game time or another loan next year, says Ricky. I absolutely think that Diallo needs to be staying at the club next year. I don't... I, I rarely agree with um, players being sent out on two consecutive loan spells. Rarely do. I think James Garner might have had two. So, you know, some can work out. But Ahmad, I think, needs to be coached. I think he needs to come in and be coached by Eric Ten Hag. And I think that, um, I think, yeah, I would like to see Ahmad stay here. That, that's, 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 that's my own opinion. And I would like to see him come in, get game time, because we need some spark on the right wing, don't we? We need some spark. And who's to say that Ahmad couldn't do that? Uh, do you think keeping up Martial is an option? I mean, technically, is an option. Um, but I don't want that option. Uh, that, that might just be a personal opinion, but I just want us to move on. Michael, do I need to call you? Did it to read out my comment? Yes, you do, clearly. Um, it's got to be Unkanku says, and uh, any updates on Pobber's next club? I don't care. I don't care. It's not going to be City. So that's the only thing I semi cared about. If Delict and Timber are available for the same price, who are, there's no way they're going to cost the same price. Timber's probably going to be about, maybe not half the price of Delict, but like 30, 40 million less than Delict. There's no way they're the same price. So that's probably not a conversation we should have. Um, don't think De Jong wants to come. No Champions League. That's what we'll find out in the next, probably in the next week or so, I reckon, ladies and gents. We get, we'll, we'll, we'll get a story from the English press either saying that Ten Hag's pull is more important to De Jong than the Champions League or we're going to get the flip reverse. That De Jong has told Ten Hag I want to play Champions League football next year and if that is the case, Ten Hag will respect that and not keep pushing. And then we'll end that pursuit and we'll go somewhere else. Um, let's go down here and see what else you're saying. I mean, I'm enjoying this. I like answering your questions. Your opinion on McLaren joining Ten Hag. Leo, I spoke about that earlier. 
think it's a good move because if Ten Hag wants him, I trust him, that McLaren's the right man. I mean, we've, we've all got our judgments on McLaren based on what he did at United back in the 90s with Fergie and also what he's done since. And he's been a bit of a... Well, he's just been in tons of jobs, isn't he? He's not exactly been a manager which inspired many. He went to be England manager and, and we know what happened there. Not particularly inspirational as a manager. I think that's pretty fair to say about him. But as an assistant, well, he did a very good job there. Very good job with United, that's for sure. Uh, Darwin Nunes is somewhat versatile. He can play left wing. Yeah, he's he's got a little bit of versatility to his game, but you would never associate the word versatile with Nunes. Not in the same way that you would in Kunku, and I think that's a fair thing to say. Nick, I know it's just a Dutch league, but his numbers, man, just insane. 96 goals scored. 17 goals conceded and 21 clean sheets in 33 matches. Well, both wingbacks scored and Timber assisted in the last game. Yeah, Timber, man. For the last like five, six games of Ajax, I've watched the full 90 minutes. Timber stands out like a sore thumb in the best possible way. 96 goals scored. Hell, if they can bang four in the last game of the season, reach that sweet 100 mark, that would be great. Of course, it's a Dutch league. Of course, it's technically a two-horse race before the season starts. But you still got to win it, right? And he's done that. Now, of course, people might point to, was it Frank de Boer who won like four titles at Ajax before he came and spectacularly failed? Let's see. Let's see. I think Eric Ten Hag's got far more to his repertoire than that. And I don't think he'll fail at Manchester United. I think we are going to be a better football club on and off the pitch because of Eric Ten Hag. And I think what we're about to witness for the next few years, get excited about, man. United are now going to genuinely win. This is the... We've had rebuilds, haven't we? We've had Van ha Van Hals wasn't a rebuild. That was just like an emergency break. Get rid of Moyers. Get someone experienced in. Mourinho was never a rebuild. Mourinho was Mourinho. We knew that Mourinho would, would probably blow up within three years. We just hoped that we would win the league before that happened. We won the Europa League and the, and the League Cup before it happened. But then he blew up and then he left. Solskjaer was the first true rebuild that we've had, to, what, that we've tried. And he went too softly, softly. And ultimately, it allowed the culture to embed itself more. That culture that he tried to get rid of, the players took advantage of his kindness. Uh, and they used it to their own advantage. And he, 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 and he lost control in the end. And now we're coming here to this new rebuild, man. This new rebuild under Eric Ten Hag, which doesn't have emotion tied to it. He's got no links to Manchester United. He's a very ambitious coach. And he's coming in with a strict system. This is the rebuild I think that we've been wanting. I'd love to see Timber as part of it. As you can see here, my video I'm going to do for lunchtime today, by the way, I'm going to run through this in a bit more detail. Ten Hag's transfer plans. Because if he wants two midfielders, a versatile forward and a centre half this summer, I'm going to explain to you exactly the four players that I think that those should be and exactly why. As I had said, what would your preferred signings be? I'm going to run through that in that video that's going out this afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining in this morning. It's Friday the 13th, but, ah, come on, we're not superstitious, are we? Man, you might be. If you're not, stay in, lock the doors, don't do anything, don't even turn a plug on. If you're not, go out and enjoy the sunshine in the UK anyways. It is scorching today. But look, I'll get that video done for lunchtime, and I'll tell you what, there hopefully is going to be a very, very special video coming here on United People's TV tomorrow, an interview with, cert with a certain somebody. And if you're in the members group on WhatsApp, you might know who that is. But look, uh, Nick, you're saying, can you do a free transfer loan moves? Um, that's, in the, that's in the pipeline. But everybody enjoy your weekend. Make sure you drop a like on the video and subscribe to United People's TV. This community is getting bigger and better. And hopefully United are getting bigger and better. We're all going to watch it together. Anyway, take it easy, everyone. Have a good weekend. United aren't going to ruin it. And of course, we're going to do it anyway. Unlucky Arsenal. We're going to do it anyway. I know we shouldn't talk about how crap Arsenal are because we're crap, but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway.